Hi, welcome back. This is part five of a series where I am going to be building a protogen head. Currently, I am wrapping up some of the stuff with the electronics. There's still a few more things to do hardware-wise, but then it's gonna be pure software. The head frame has shipped from the person I ordered it from uh, a few days ago. So hopefully I will have that in the next few weeks. We'll find out. I don't know when I'm gonna get that, but when I do, I can start installing stuff into it. At that point, I will be able to get proper measurements so I can actually order some good PCBs instead of just having everything haphazardly assembled. And then I can start finishing the, fr the head frame as well. And I need to order some materials for that just in case those take a while to get here. Uh, I'll probably get a lot of that stuff locally at uh, crafting at crafts stores, but I know that there's gonna be some of the stuff that I'm not gonna be able to do that for. So I'll have to get it from online retailers. So I wanna get that started so I don't wait for shipping. Um, since the last part, last weekend I spent most of my time just refactoring the code. A lot of it was pretty hacky to get the DMA working for the display here and for the display over here. They were like referencing each other's code. It was very, it was gross, but it worked. Uh, so I spent some time going through and refactoring it so it all be configurable and so they wouldn't all be interacting with each other's code. And that went pr well. It was working great, so it was. I decided, okay, what's next? Mainly just been working on hardware stuff still. Uh, once I get that all done, then when I'm ready to sit down and just write some software for like the actual implementation of what I wanna do here, I will definitely do some recording of that like as I'm coding instead of just after the fact, like I have been so far. But I've kind of made more progress on this stuff than I thought I was going to on just feature stuff as well. There's one big thing that I want to talk about, but I'm going to talk about that later because I just discovered it an hour or two ago and I still don't understand what's going on, but maybe you'll notice before I get to it. There. So this is the animation that I've been using as my normal just, you know, how's it all working type thing. Still works great. Not, obviously this isn't going to be long term, but until I get started on the actual animating of everything, this is good. And I'll probably still have this hiding in a menu somewhere to just activate for benchmarking. And I'm gonna bring back the light. And by that, I mean adjust the, the aperture or exposure and turn the actual light on. Camera setup's a little bit different today because I'm gonna be needed to show the OLED a lot. So this, the side camera is focused just on that. Apologies if there's jump cuts because of that. That's just how it is. I've got most of the hardware hooked up right now of stuff that I'm actually gonna be using long run. I ordered a an, uh, real-time clock, an RTC to Hopefully avoid having to do the NTP lookup every single time. Plus that won't help if you're somewhere that you don't have Wi-Fi. All right, just so you have a clock that's accurate for your little internal time display or accurate enough. This one's not super accurate. It's supposed to be like two seconds a day, but I'm also noticing that it doesn't like remembering the actual time at all. I don't know if the battery that I got is just low or if something else is going on, but it is, it's weird. Maybe maybe I should try the other one I got because I got two, I believe. Just, I don't know, it's acting up. I've got the boop sensor hooked up and I've got the driver for the accelerometer on the matrix portal board hooked up. So it'll I'll be able to use that to like detect if you're like take, took the head off and put it down somewhere and forgot to turn it off so it can blink the displays to save battery after a few minutes or something, you know, stuff like that. Um, or fun animations like just stuff showing gravity on the screens. I don't know. It just, it's there, I might as well use it. I also have the microphone plugged in, but I haven't even started doing any software for that. So it's just plugged in for the sake of being plugged in right now. So on, on this board here, um, you may notice I put some buttons on it. I didn't think it through all the way when I did that. I wasted an hour and a half putting those buttons on, beeping everything out to make sure I knew what pin was what, putting the buttons on, soldering everything up. I got some nice multicolor wire now, but I completely forgot that the connector on the matrix portal board that goes all these pins can only be used for output because they have three volt to five volt level shifters in front of them. So you can't use them for input, which really sucks because that basically means there are, what, uh, seven input pins for buttons that are off, off of the main board over here. 
Um, there's the two buttons built into it, up and down. Uh, there's the one pin that's on this connector that's intended for audio, which is what I want to use it for. There's the TX and RX serial pins. Uh, and there's four more analog capable pins broke out here, which is what I'm using right now. I'm using two of those for, for now. But that, that's it for the input that you can do to this board, which is annoying. I completely forgot about that. Uh, and obviously I squared C. But yeah, I really wish I could have uh, could have used these buttons on that connector because there's so many pins that I'm not using. I think there's like five extra pins, but they can only be used for output. So that's annoying. So everything else is going to have to go through those seven, the, these six uh, pins on the header over here, which really sucks, but it is what it is. I should be okay. I don't really need more than two buttons. If I use the two buttons that are on the board, I can use two external buttons and then it should be fine. I would have liked to have been able to put four buttons and a nice little uh, D-pad or cross formation on a, a board and just have them all there or square something, just have them all right next to each other. But, oh well, worry about it later. So anyway, let, let's just look at some of the other stuff I've been, I've been working on. Because as I mentioned, I got the clock set up, I've got the proximity sensor set up, got the accelerometer set up. Uh, something else that I was working on was a menu. But before I go into any of that, let's just watch the, the boot process. Which there shouldn't be much of anything on the serial output, but I am going to still screen cap it. And that's it, it's done booting already. So using the uh, RTC chip, is significantly faster to boot. It actually did have the correct time that time. So it boots in less than a second. Unless it needs, unless either you don't have the RTC plugged in or the RTC doesn't have valid time or whatever, then it will try to connect to Wi-Fi and set the clock that way. And uh, you may have noticed that once it booted, like watch the screen here, we get boot message and then it's animating, but we still have the boot messages here. And then five seconds after that, Five seconds after that, there we go. It goes back to its uh, idle display here, which I've uh, changed significantly in that A, it clears the screen, doesn't just update the bottom, but B, has a lot more stuff on it now. Let's just go through this stuff right now because this will get to the, the thing that I discovered a few hours ago. So here at the top left is the current time, 12 hour clock. Uh, we don't need AM or PM or date. Uh, presumably you're gonna know enough about that. But just, just so you don't lose complete track of time, we have the clock. We have the frame rate, which you might notice is 70 hertz. Uh, more on that in a bit. And then over here we have the free memory on the go heap. Um, it's counting down quite quickly now. Uh, I had gotten it to a point where it was going very slowly, but that was before I had a lot of these updates. But we, you see we have 178K of total memory and we're using a lot, <laughs> just doing all these updates. But when it gets down towards zero, the garbage collector kicks in and it's actually not that noticeable when it happens, just looking at the screens. I don't really see it hitching. So that's better than it was, which again is related to something I found earlier. On the next line, uh, the first value over here is the value from the proximity sensor and it's seeing the wires above it right now. So if I move these wires out of the way, it'll go, go up to 255 and I put my finger above it, it'll you know, range in and out. We already, we already messed with this in a previous, vid previous video, so we're not gonna go too much into that, but that's the proximity sensor. And then the next three values are the X, Y, and Z values from the accelerometer in, uh, milligravity basically so we can see that the z value is you know up basically 1000 so that's the, the the z axis is pointing towards the ground excuse me and if i move the board around you can see the numbers changing wildly yeah it's hard to read because it all bunt, jumps around when the lengths change but this is just for 
debugging and making sure everything works. And then at the bottom, I have it scrolling a downmixed copy of what's on the outside screens, looking only at the red channel and only if it's above a certain relatively high value, which should be enough for just knowing basically what's going on on the outside of the face. This screen is updated as often as it can be, which is not the same update rate as the external screens. The external screens are updated every frame, which is what this frame rate is indicating here. But the internal split display, since it's using the shared I2C bus via DMA, I talked about this last time, mixing DMA and non-DMA and I2C can cause issues, but I put a way in to detect when the bus is already busy or still busy doing a DMA transfer and then just skipping doing other stuff. So I'm doing that. Uh, if the screen is still being updated when it starts the next frame, it just skips updating the screen for that frame, and it also skips reading the accelerometer and the boop sensor for that frame. I haven't measured how long this takes, but I think it probably is running at, I don't know, 20 FPS for those, maybe 25. I haven't actually measured it. You can tell it's a little bit jumpier on that screen than it is on this screen because it's scrolling multiple pixels at a time. This is scrolling one pixel every frame, so this is probably scrolling three or four pixels, two, or th two to four pixels every frame. So that's cool. Uh, and the other big thing that I have done is I got the menu working, or mostly working. There, there is code to do a menu now. This is just the normal screen here. So as I mentioned, I have buttons on this board, but they don't work because they can only be used for output, not input, that's sad. Uh, I've got the up and down buttons on the matrix portal them, uh, itself. I'm using those to reduce the number of other buttons I need right now. And I've got two buttons here on the breadboard. One is a back button, one is a menu button. The back button does nothing right now. If I hit the menu button, it loads the menu. I need to scroll in a little bit more so you can read that. It loads the menu. A lot of the stuff on this menu is just testing code to see if the menu works. Also, if you don't press any buttons for like 10 seconds, it goes back like it just did. So I go back into the menu um, and hit down instead of up. Oh, there's garbage, there's, there's noise over here. I know what it is, I'll fix it. It's just the pixels from the animation. I haven't uh, fixed that yet. But if I go into like this example sub menu here, you can see that we have another sub menu. So that's cool. And we can go back out. And if we go down to this setting number one here, we can see that we have a setting that has a bunch of values. There is no button repeat right now. I might make it do button repeat, but oh well. If you hit back, it doesn't change it. See, it's on B. If I go down to like E and then I hit menu and go back, you'll see that it's on E now. So that's cool. Uh, as far as things that you can actually do in here, there's this Blank the screen, which doesn't work for similar reasons why there's garbage. I need to fix this. Press another button to wake it up. There's also the hardware settings menu, which uh, the first thing here is brightness. So if I turn the brightness all the way down, you'll notice that there's barely anything uh, on these screens anymore. It's very dim. However, I can Turn the brightness all the way up, and it is significantly brighter. And for comparison, that is what it was at before, and this is the default value. So every time it reboots, it's going to go to this until I implement settings saving, which is related to format flash. There's a two megabyte quad spy flash chip on the matrix portal board. Earlier today, I decided I would go start hooking it up and just messing around with it and seeing what I could do. Well, once I got the flash driver hooked up from TinyGo's driver's repository using the Quad Spy bus, because that's how it's hooked up on this chip, uh, and this is the only chip that the TinyGo repository supports Quad Spy on for flash for that matter, something very peculiar happened. This, the effective speed of the board basically doubled. 
So I had uh, the frame rate limit set to 60 FPS in my code, but it was only running at about 43, 44. I loaded up the code that could talk to the flash chip and I just noticed that the animations, on the, the scrolling animation was faster, smoother than it was before. I'm like, that's weird. I look at the frame rate counter and it was pegged right at 60 hertz. I was like, huh, that's weird. I, get, I went and changed the frame rate limiter to 120 just to see what would happen and it ran up to 90 hertz. And I was like, huh, that's really weird. All I did was talk to the flash chip. Well, I pulled all that code out, well, revert, stashed it to the side, went back to the previous code, and sure enough, it was back to 43, 44 hertz. And just initializing the code to talk to the flash chip apparently does something to the clock speeds on this processor and makes it run twice as fast. I don't know if that means TinyGo is initializing something incorrectly in the first place or what, but it is just faster now, and I'm not complaining about that. Like, this is great. Uh, I currently think I, it's still set to limit to 120. Maybe I set it to 90. I don't know. But now that it's mirroring to the internal or to the OLED as well, it's only running at 70, which is still a hell of a lot better than 44. And Previously, when I was mirroring to the OLED, it was only running at like 25, so, whoa. That literally just stopped when I was looking at it. Uh, uh oh. Um. Well, that's never happened before. Okay, I don't even remember what I was saying when it just, the screen froze and then it froze when I hit a button. So I hope, uh, I, I had left it running for over an hour earlier and it was perfectly fine. The chip isn't warm at all, so I don't know what that was. Maybe there was just some random uh, electrical noise caused something weird, but the, the, the screen froze with the image on it, which means that the processor was still running to be able to redraw because the way these work, if you're not actively redrawing, it goes off. You'd only, you'd end up with no more than one line of pixel, well, two lines of pixels if the CPU is completely dead. So that was weird. Oh, it stopped again. Maybe something with how I move this stuff it's unhappy or maybe the I don't know I don't know what I did but it's unhappy now and if I hit a button it freezes again and again it's stuck with the image on the screen so it's not completely dead well anyway back to the menu so hardware settings there's the brightness there's uh, set time from NTP which does what it says, and it, it turns the Hourglass logo back on, and it can use this display for log messages, so it's just gonna reset the clock. It sets the RTC, you know, and then uh, after a few seconds, it goes back to how it normally is. And the last thing in here, which is safe to do right now, because I'm not actually storing anything on it, is the flash. Format flash, you go down to yes, and then it waits five seconds, just in case, you know, needs to wait, but then it, it erases it, formats it, and just continues on. Now I'm curious if setting the clock screwed the clock, because, yeah, it says bogus. It thinks it's 1999. I don't get it. If I set the clock from this code, it, always resets it to midnight on November 30th, 1999. Always. But if I use the code that I wrote to test the driver that does almost, the, that does basically the same thing, NTP and then set it, and I, uh, it works fine. And I don't, I don't know what's different. Like if I just do this, oops. Uh, 
I just run, you know, flash the code to reset the clock. It's going to realize that that makes no sense, and it's going to NTP, and it sets it correctly. And if I go flash my code, my main code back on here, the clock will be right because it's pulling it from the RTC, which was set correctly. But if this code sets it, it's just wrong. I don't get it. Not sure what's going on there. There's got to be something weird. Oh, uh, actually, I think I might know because I think I was being a I was being a stupid. I was being a stupid. Yeah. Ha! I was being a stupid. There you go. Oops. There we go. It needs to wait for the screen update to finish. This is a, I was having this problem when I was turning on uh, DMA for I squared C. But since I literally just put something on the screen, that means there's a there's communication going on. But then I try to trounce over it by doing something differently. Well, it needs to wait until it's done. Uh, the, the display is done with it until it can uh, take over. And I probably have the same problem up uh, Let me copy my comment down here. I probably have the same problem during boot because it'll fall back to setting the clock during boot if it needs to. So... Uh, yeah, I need to grab my... Oh, you know what? Let's put the little delay there just because that saves a little bit of power. So at this point, it need, when it saves the clock, it needs to do this. There we go. That should fix it. So I go flash the fixed code on here. I need to set a timer when I'm using my DSLR because it will not record a video longer than half an hour. It will stop itself. Anyway, coding live. I flash the fixed code onto here. So now if I go into the menu, uh, set time from NTP. If I go in here, I wonder if I have the same problem when I'm reading the clock. Oh, it absolutely has the same problem when it reads the clock. Jesus. All right, I need to make a, a, a function here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just scroll up here and uh, funk the driver. Funky driver, wait for EMA, and then all I gotta do is search for that. Call d dot wait for DMA. Skip that one. I guess I don't need to do a. Oh, this is gonna this is gonna cause uh, compile errors everywhere else because I don't need that. Oop! Because that doesn't make any sense anymore. Oh, and these need to be function calls. Oh, there you go. You got you got some live coding with me today. Oh, yeah. That's just always like that. So I need to. Here, wait for DMA there, and then I print some. Then 
Okay, no, I, this is all structured to only print on problems, right? So we, this is fine. That goes over the USB serial. It's this, whenever I, whenever I interact with buff, it needs to wait. And I think we're good here. Okay, cool. So let's go ahead and just for good measure, reflash the refactor code to have that in a shared location. And that will also be pulling the clock from the RTC. And we can hopefully see that it is set correctly. And time zone ad adjustment isn't taken into account. But other than the time zone, it is set correctly. Yes, it is set correctly. No, it's not. We got the time zone offset set here twice in the wrong direction. Unless that's PM. All right, I'll figure it out later. I or. Maybe now, I don't know. Uh, time, TZ offset, yeah, here. So the RTC is, right, the RTC is getting set to UTC, I think. Uh, what, are, what are we setting the, so we're setting, when, when we do the NTP, we're doing a time zone offset adjustment to be the correct time zone. Is there, a, is there a way to set the time zone? I don't think there is. Yeah, look, oh, maybe. Hmm. What do you got here in time? Is this just go? This looks like go. This does not look like time kind of go. I should probably actually try to use time zones here. Well, let's see what happens. Sure. This is the name that that wants it in seconds. So I have no idea if this is going to work. So that means that I all I want to always means I basically don't ever want to deal with the time zone offset that now dot in and dot UTC I think that's what I want to have in here so if I come down to here Maybe, I don't know, let's find out. Because this would certainly make it easier than having to make sure I handle the time zone offsets correctly myself. And hey, I could put it in the menu to give you different time zone offsets. You know, you're gonna be traveling or doing a con over the weekend that, the, that daylight saving starts or ends. So what does it say? Now, I think, the, I think the, R, the RTC is set wrong. So that's part of the problem right now. So let's go reset the RTC. All right, it says 720. That's correct. Uh, let's just reset and see what happens. It's 720, okay, that seems to have worked. So hooray, I wrote some code on camera and it, it worked. So I fixed, I fixed not being able to set the time and, and I haven't always get corrupted and I fixed uh, the time zone issue related to that. And this is, makes time zones a lot easier to, to reason with in the code since it's just, you know, actually being dealt with here. So that's cool. That means I don't even need to pass in a time zone offset to the NTP function. Cool. Hooray. Usefully written code. We had the, uh, the code has gotten kind of complicated now, but that's to be expected. Uh, I've refactored stuff to make the boop sensor uh, make more sense to 
add support for accelerometer readings, to be able to detect when the bus is still busy for the display, to be able to skip those readings, to be able to handle all the different modes that the display can be in, the idle mode, the menu mode, the boot log mode, uh, to time out a menu, because again, if I hit the menu button and then don't do anything for about 10 seconds, it will take me back out to the idle mode. Um, any second out, there it goes. On that note, as far as menus are concerned, there's three different kinds of menus in here. There's a submenu, like this, which has a plus. There's an action, which uh, like this one, which has an asterisk. And then there are settings, like this, which have a greater than sign. Uh, submenus are just another copy of a menu. And if you, if you go into, ah, took too long. If you go into a submenu, you can hit back and it'll take you back to the previous menu. Uh, actions are what they sound, sound like is you hit it and it does something like setting the clock or formatting the flash. It just does a thing. And then the settings are the things that you actually want to configure. Uh, I need to add more real things here, like time zone would be a good one now that I have time zones working. <laughs> Um, something else that would be good might be adjusting this little mirror of the display, adjusting which color it looks at, what the threshold is of that color, instead of just being hard coded to something on red, maybe to turn it off if needed. Uh, I don't know why, but, but you could. And, you know, other fun stuff. And eventually I want to be able to save settings to the flash chip. That's why I was getting it wired up. I'm glad I did that now because it runs a lot faster. Uh, I might not actually hook up saving settings to it for right now, but at least initializing it makes it run faster. Don't understand why. Because, like, if we go to uh, where that happens, which is... Uh, here. So I take this entire block of code and comment it out. This is the code that initializes the QSPY device to talk to the flash chip and then initializes the file system on top of that. But if I just comment that out, it's not going to talk, try to talk to it at all. Uh, if I flash it with a commented out, we should be back to it being slow. And it should be even slower now than it was before since it's mirroring the animation as well. And it is incredibly slow. You can, just looking at it, you can tell it's slower. You don't even need to wait for the frame rate counter to show up. Yeah, 28 hertz. So it's running at less than half the speed. That's insane. 29. And it was running at 70. So it's running at less than half speed just because we're not talking to the flash chip. I don't get it. But, oh well, that's just how it is right now. I don't... Uh, that just is what it is. Yeah, if you notice the taskbar down here, I, uh, I tooted about that when I found out about it. And I was like, okay, I don't get it. And on common end, it's back to, no to full speed. So I don't get it. Anyway, next steps are mess with that microphone. I don't know what I'm going to do with it yet. I want to see if there's any remotely easy way to just detect that there's something going on to react to. Beyond that, I guess start writing some real code. And the prerequisite to that, pixel art. I need to figure out exactly what I want the faces to look like and make the images for them so I can put them in here and load them. Um, that's another thing I could maybe use the QSPY Flash for is storing image assets. So like you do a two-stage load where you load a loader that just crams the program space of the processor full of images and then it boots and then shoves those into the flash and then you flash the actual program and it pulls them out of there. I don't think I want to do that if I can help it because that just makes it more complicated. As it is right now, I'm not even using half of the storage on the processor. It's got half a mega flash and I'm using about 200K. So I'm not worried about that yet. A better idea than that would be to use an SD card, but that would require almost all of the I.O. pins that 
remain on the board because that would need to be a spy bus. So right there you need at least four pins and there are six pins left. So that would uh, be quite limiting. One thing I have slightly considered is getting like a GPIO expander uh, interface that plugs in the I squared C and gives you like eight or 16 additional basically bits that you can use as input or output. Obviously that's a bit slower to deal with and that's something else you have to pull or at least you could, or maybe you could set up like an interrupt so it'll flag when it's like, hey, I have something. Even if I don't use it as an interrupt and just have it set a bit, then I can use that one bit as input instead of two bits. Oh boy, well, at that point I put all four buttons out there. It's a, it's a thought. I'm going to need to do something like that if I want to have like other hidden inputs like Hall Effect sensors where you like put your hand somewhere and it triggers something. So I probably need to get at least one of those regardless. I should probably try to make an actual schematic of what I have going on here in KiCad and then try to start working on a PCB design. I don't think I really want to order a PCB until I get the head frame and I can see how much physical space I have behind the panels, between them inside there with my head in there. Just so, so I don't, you know, build stuff that's gonna poke me in the nose or the eye. Uh, so I don't build something that's gonna completely block my vision. Because at this point, this setup works well enough that I don't need a board in the interim. But that that's my current status. Um, I'm trying to get better at making these videos. I've done a bunch of stuff this week and just completely like didn't record anything that I probably should have. Here, here we are now. Next update will hopefully be a bit more of a code heavy update. Either a code heavy update or a keycat heavy update. Haven't figured it out yet. That's the plan. This, I, I may end up recording more to put into this video, but I think I've got enough right now because I've been talking for about 45 minutes. So I'm gonna wrap it up right now. Uh, I've noticed I've got a lot more views on part four. So thank you all for watching. If you like what you're seeing, hit the like button, hit subscribe, and thanks for watching. All right, quick little detour here in post-production. When I was writing the menu code, I made extensive use of the simulator because it's a lot easier to just start the program again when it can just run immediately on a computer as opposed to having to flash it onto the device and waiting for it to start up, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't think I've really showed the simulator here much before, so I'm going to just do a very quick demo of that and show how the menu worked on that as well as on the actual hardware. So I hit play and then it starts up and I got to move everything over here so you can see it. So you can see it's doing the same thing as the hardware does. Uh, if I clear out there, uh, we also don't have any inputs for accelerometer or boop sensor as to be expected. The memory is also not updating. Actually, I think the screen might not be updating at all because these aren't working. So that's immaterial to what we're trying to do right now. So if I hit menu, it loads up the menu and I can scroll through it uh, just like I could on the hardware. Back works or I can go in and select something. Uh, hardware settings doesn't have any configuration because it's a simulator. It doesn't need anything. Uh, and just yeah, the simulator, it works. So, thought I'd show that really quick.